So I'm here with Don Shumway and Ray Siebold to talk. And we're going to talk about their chip boiler. And uh, this is, we're at uh, Crotchet Mountain Rehabilitation Center. And thanks very much for submitting to this. Um, <laughs> Can you tell me to start with what gave you the idea to think about a, 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 a boiler like this, a, a chip boiler? Where did the idea come from? Okay, well, we worked for really a couple of years on a campus master plan. And so it wasn't exactly a question of what uh, is the exact heating system or energy use um, that we were put to, but rather um, how do we do an integrated design project that looks to the future. It's really been about a oh, five or six year process that led us to having a, a wood chip uh, heating plant. It was part of an integrated design project. We did a campus master plan and an overall land use plan uh, that allowed us to look into the future and make sure that we were going to be able to uh, work in the most efficient way possible with scarce resources to undertake an overall uh, redesign of all of the campus infrastructure, not just energy, but wastewater, uh, uh, communications uh, and uh, digital communications, phone systems, uh, roadways, everything, um, and also get rid of some buildings that were problematic, that hadn't been uh, using good waste management principles, et cetera, our old maintenance building, et cetera. They had to be cleaned up, and we had to figure out a new way of working. Uh, and supporting a large campus, a hospital, a school, et cetera. And so we pulled together uh, a team of folks both inside the organization and we went outside to the best engineering we could find, best architecture we could find, and said, you know, we really wanted to go through a number of projects, but let's start and look at the whole. You know, let's figure out where we are going. Let's figure out what our current load is in all sorts of different, again, engineering patterns, wastewater, for example. And um, let's figure out what it should be optimized to be. Um, what should these loads be? And how do we get to that point? And then what is the technology that we best use uh, to work uh, at that level? So it really was when we completed a campus master plan that we then started zeroing in on certain systems. And so Ray uh, was our project manager through that process, part of that team. Um, and when we began to look at the heating hot water, et cetera. Um, we worked with a number of different folks who helped us through that process. So you want to pick that up? Okay. Sure. <clears throat> Part of that campus master plan was um, visualizing what Crotchet Mountain was going to be in 10 years and what the community was going to be, uh, what the living um, conglomerations will be. We really liked the uh, Danish model of co-housing and wanted to uh, make the center of campus pedestrian friendly with different neighborhoods which would be the co-housing. And these clusters, initially we considered that they could have their own heating energy within that cluster as opposed to having a central heating source. Um, so that was one of the options in the early design stages. And um, we wanted to move the truck traffic and uh, much of the uh, auto traffic to the perimeter. There's a footprint um, with a loop road around the campus, so we really wanted to have the development contained within that footprint, but also to have a pedestrian-friendly center aisle. So that gave us certain parameters in terms of locating things, and it also gave us a overall size projection for the overall heating load. So we had, um, I can't remember the total number of neighborhoods um, that we had um, guessed that would event be eventually the total build out. And from there, looking at the existing um, building mass and assuming a certain amount of uh, reduction of energy load in the existing buildings, be able to project an overall load uh, for a total need of a new in t uh, system that would handle the whole campus. And how did you come to the whole campus idea as opposed to the centers? So we did a series of studies that looked at um, the specific fuels and their 
construction. So, for example, we could have distributed pellet boilers. Um, and we, we looked at that and did the scenario planning against that. Um, what would the environmental impact be? What's the supply of them? What would the cost of them be? What would the management and operations be? Um, how would you deal with ash and so forth? What's all the byproducts and the like? Um, and um, at the same time, we looked at a central district heating system and the notion of a centrally fired uh, wood chip boiler uh, system. And we looked at other um, alternatives too, but, it was, but we clearly were starting to zero in through those studies uh, on biomass. And um, we're in a forested area, the southern, southwestern part of New Hampshire. Uh, get on the bottom of the hill, turn right, go by a large sawmill, uh, go up the road, there's another one. So it's really a wood products industry. Um, and part of what we're also trying to do is to protect um, more than 1,200 acres of land with a conservation easement, but preserving up the rights for forestry, um, things like that. So we're trying to be part of really building an economy, a wood products economy, and um, so we started as being very attractive to be able to use with the to use the, the local sawmills waste products, if you will, of their non-lumber grade uh, slabs, branches, uh, trees that were not at that quality. Um, so we began to really zero in on biomass and wood chips specifically by those very formal studies. We then can, uh, commissioned. Um, an organization, the Biomass uh, Resource Center out of uh, Montpelier, I believe it was, Burke, um, Burke to do a series of studies, um, wood chip supply. We want to make sure that um, it was likely that there would be a very reliable supply, uh, that its uh, cost was likely to be uh, also reliable, that we could see a mm -hmm. relatively non-fluctuating cost. Um, we wanted to know that we could source it locally. Um, and transport it, et cetera. So it was really a good supply chain that we were looking at. Um, we did an economic study of that, and this is pre-Hurricane Katrina. I think oil was at a buck sixty-five a gallon or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. And um, so you want to see an overall payback of investing in this whole district heating system, all the pipes underground, the boilers, et cetera, all the heat exchanges in the buildings and the like. And I think they estimated at those oil prices um, and the price of chips. Uh, there was something like a five to seven year payback, I think was their original mm -hmm. estimate. Um, so that fell within the norms um, that we were looking for. Um, we then did a technology study with them to make sure that we were able to find um, good suppliers of the total technology process that was uh, there. And um, there were both um, some U.S. and Canadian suppliers that were good. There are also a lot of Europeans. This is not an uncommon system in Europe, although it is somewhat uncommon in the U.S. Um, and so we, we really did our homework. And um, all of those studies, by the way, are available. We're happy to make them available and have made them available to lots of other organizations. And um, so that really gave us the confidence to um, commit ourselves to this. And then uh, the final study was the really the bid documents for the technology, the specific plant that we would build, ultimately um, kind of what I call the pre-construction documents themselves uh, that was done by Burke. Um, and, um, you know, it's clear they knew what they were doing, um, so we needed help. We brought in that technical help, and um, they really delivered for us. So then the bids were released, and why don't you pick up with that? Well, I want to backtrack just a little bit in, in terms of the pellets. I recall, I mean, we were making these decisions in 2004, there was one pellet supplier in the area. Some years before they had a fire, and so the security of supply was a serious issue in choosing pellets at that time. Mm -hmm. They've certainly um, exploded in terms of the availability since then, but I wanted to put it in the context. Sure. And, and they've um, had another fire since, I understand. Well, yeah, one. yeah. And the, um, the other thing is the uh, threshold, I don't know if it's true these days with changing technology, but it, at that time the threshold uh, for viability, financial viability of pellets was 2 million BTU. Beyond that, it didn't make sense. It made sense to invest in the materials handling of chips. And that's the, the big thing, the, um, the big cost of wood chips over pellets is handling these 
matchstick size, uh, matchbook size uh, um, chips that do not flow like pellets, like grain. Uh, wood, uh, wood pellets you can put in a grain silo. They come very nicely in a cone and flow out very nicely. Um, wood chips will create bridge and create a, a dam. So if you put it in the same kind of silo, it's going to yeah. clog and it'll never work. Um, there are systems that were built early on that did not allow for that, and they had all kinds of vibrators and th things to. Uh, bump to try and break that and it's it's always a pain in the butt. So uh, the materials handling was crucial and being able to find the supplier that had the right uh, uh, a, a chip handling system that did not um, have problems. There were two primary systems out there. One was called a moving floor where um, it was a, a wedge uh, driven hydraulically uh, where one side was steeper than the other. So it would just slide back and forth. The, the steep side would slide under the chips, and, uh, or the shallow side, and the steep side would push chips this way. And it would push it out into a conveyor belt. The, this system was prone to uh, problems and to repair it, you had to take all the chips out to get access to it. So there were there were a couple manufacturers that only used that system. So that was uh, certainly a, a consideration in, in us putting it out to bid. We wanted to get a system that was more reliable. There was another one where it was a, a traveling auger that traveled back and forth and just pulled the chips in. And to that point, had seemed had a very high reliability. The also the mechanical end was not under the chips. It was uh, in an open alleyway uh, near the conveyor belt. So if you had any problems with it, you could work on it right then and there and not have to remove any chips. So we lined it all up and went to contract. Um, we got some really good bids, including the fuel bids and. Um, it was clear we had a pathway that we could follow, so um, we uh, contracted with a company, a uh, U.S. company, uh, for the production of the system. It, it relied on pieces of technology that had been available widely for some time, but had never been integrated in the way that they would be here. Uh, their scale uh, was larger than you would typically see, uh, but not as large as the big power plants, um, so it was really an intermediate scale. Um, in addition, the um, technology um, integrated multiple boilers, including a backup oil boiler, um, which we had some in existence um, on the campus or, and, and did put in one new one. So we were really able to set up a fuel reliability that was, um, for us, very important. In trying to run a hospital, you've got to have redundant systems, and um, one of the fuel redundancy was, was important to us, so we always had a backup source of fuel. But we wanted biomass to be our primary, and it has turned out to be so reliable, and um, its performance so um, really beyond the specs we even thought we were going to get out of the system, um, that we really haven't turned to the oil at all, uh, except when we shut the whole thing down for a total cleaning uh, mm -hmm. once a year. Um, so we went to construction. Um, Construction lasted, oh, probably a year and a bit on it. For the chip plant, we broke ground in early July, and the boiler, boiler was actually running before Christmas. That's right. We were wow. trying it out. Um, yeah. And that included all of the underground district piping, the blasting, construction of the chip building, and installation of the equipment. Um, and then there was a period of time of uh, commissioning and breaking it in. So it wasn't fully online at that time, but it was running. <clears throat> and really from day one, it has run, you could call it flawless. Um, because it was new technology, we've been tweaking it, and the companies that support it have been great to work with and have been making improvements as we go along. But really from day one, um, we have been able to say the system uh, met our specifications uh, or exceeded them. Um, 
did so with an efficiency of fuel use and production of BTUs beyond um, what we had hoped for, and uh, its reliability has been terrific. And um, the result has been uh, probably, uh, well, I think we're getting a, a delivered BTU at about an equivalent of about 64 cents per gallon of oil if it was an oil-based system. That's something I can't drag up from. Right. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's the number. And so, just so people understand, this is July 16th, 2012. Right. And what is the cost of uh, oil now? Well, it's more than three and a quarter. You know, okay. it's some, somewhere in the mid three buck range. There you go. And so it's our seven year payback, maybe five, probably became five or more likely three. So we really saved um, the investment uh, in a few short years. And that has been a big big deal for us because we do mostly indigent support here for people um, that are either on Medicaid or don't have health coverage, um, et cetera. And so we have to keep our operating costs really low. So one of the things I've tried to help other organizations looking at uh, these decisions is to not shy away from bringing in the best quality consultants, uh, setting up an pro internal project management team where you're going to invest in good people and then being willing to say, we're willing to take on new technology and we want it to be the state of the art, environmentally appropriate technology. And what you're gonna turn around and find is that you um, have very good availability of um, technologies. Your chance of um, lowering your energy costs are huge. And at the end of the day, you've also lowered your risk management. So not only the reliability of the system, but also what happens when we have a fuel spill which we've had. We've had some amazing fuel spills of a couple of bushels of wood chips. We get mm -hmm. our rigs and brooms. I mean, it's like, this is good. Let's throw them on the garden. And, you know, it's such a different thing to walk into our chip plant and smell it. It smells lovely. You know, and, and here it is now, four years, five years later. It's clean. It smells nice. It's a pleasure to work in. The staff who go into there are exposed to no chemicals, no problems. Uh, in terms of their breathing, their exposure to um, uh, volatile organic compounds of any kind. And um, the emissions uh, from the chip plant um, so exceed EPA or um, DES standards that really they're working to figure out what should the new standard be for very low emission plants because they've never worked this low. Um, and we cut our emissions for, and you know, we do ventilated breathing care here. We had a, we had, it matters to us that we cannot have low rings of smokestacks around this hospital building and be emitting both gases and particles um, that affect individual breathing. Our emissions are so clean, all you're basically getting is a plume of hot water um, in the, uh, that you can see on the cold days. Um, it's a substantial improvement all around. Waste products, wood ash. Um, and what do you do with the wood ash? As long as you distribute it, it has no um, environmental impact other than it would be considered a, um, a weak fertilizer for uh -huh. a forest or field and the like. So you, you spread it? Yes, exactly. Yeah, it's I, a valuable product. I took, well, I take my uh, wood ashes from my stove and put them in my compost. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's, that's the idea. In terms of the emissions that Don was talking about, the choice that we made at the beginning is that we could have gone with what's called a, uh, um, a multi-cyclone separator and that would have satisfied the state emission standard at that time, uh, which I believe was uh, 0.3 pounds per million BTUs. And we decided to go with a technology called a bag house, which is a fabric filter, uh, think vacuum cleaner, uh, where it first passes through a multi-cyclone, gets out the bigger particles, and then goes through the bag house, uh, a tower with many bags in each uh, system and it gets out the finest particles and what it does is it starts caking up inside there so the more it cakes up the font more the better filtering it does and then when it gets to a certain point where there's a pressure difference and it says okay it's time to take it offline and put another one it blows it with a puff of air and all of that particulate goes down into a, a, a 55 gallon drum we made that decision to go with a technology that was well beyond, at least 10 times uh, better than the standard at that time because of what Don was referring to, that we wanted to be 
good stewards of the community and for our own clients that we didn't want to we wanted to pollute as minimal as possible at that point that was the uh, best technology possible to jump back a little farther um, I think relevant to your class choosing good engineers helped us decide to go with heat only as opposed to uh, a CHP combined heat and power um, if you're going with heat, combined heat and power, you either track your load um, and create electricity for the total load that you need. And ours runs somewhere around um, 800 uh, uh, kilowatt hours. Um, uh, and our load, if we were going to produce that much electricity, we would be producing so much heat, we would never be able to use it. it would be, we'd be wasting it, we'd be having cooling towers trying to get rid of it, like an electric generation station, where the efficiency is, you know, 25% perhaps. Um, and if you track your, um, your heat load, in, so you track, say we, use, we need 10 million BTUs of heat, and we can produce some electricity um, since we don't need uh, a high pressure steam, we're just using hot water. That was another choice. Um, high pressure steam, you need an engineer on site to run it all the time. Um, hot water, uh, you don't need any special um, operators to run the system. So a couple of questions related to that. Is there much in the way of maintenance? I know you mentioned um you know, sure. taking it offline once a year? Yeah, there, there is maintenance. Um, the reality is that uh, virtually all of the equipment um, can be bought from a, a standard supply catalog, with the exception of the, um, the brain, the, the CPU that's operating, or the PLC that, that's operating the system. The uh, uh, conveyor belts, uh, the fans, all of those things are easily purchased uh, and maintained with without a whole lot of special um, schooling. It's really kind of a funny combination of very old technology. The yeah. screw. Did Archimedes invent the screw? I don't know. Yeah. Where did this come from? The conveyor belt. Um, and the uh, boilers look like uh, locomotive engines. And mm -hmm. uh, But then you look at the brain and the uh, pollution control system state of the art. And so you're marrying these technologies with a very simple product, a waste byproduct of making lumber uh, or wood chip. And, and I think it's that blend that allows it to be local, locally sourced, easily connected us to the guy who runs the sawmill. Um, these are jobs that the woman who you know works in our kitchen, her husband's head of the logging crew that's producing the chips, you know, and so you're able to knit together an economy around this that you just can't if you're looking at something that is so exotic, um, something that is um, so um, uniquely advanced, but, but you're able to bring in just the right new pieces that were never available to, uh, and combine pieces that have been around for a long time, but in innovative ways connected to a larger community. It comes together remarkably well. Great. How about financing? How did that work? One of the big issues, of course, with any renewable project is uh, the the upfront costs. How did you um, how, how did that work for you? Um, financing is challenging. Uh, we uh, let's see. We because we had done really good economic feasibility studies, et cetera. We were able to put together a financing package, loans, so it was, I think, 100% borrowed money for the chip plant um, and district heating system. So we borrowed all the money, um, but we're able to show a savings value and a reliability, that is, that this um, lifespan was going to be so good, the cleanliness, the risk management that I talked about is going to be so positive on this, that it made it a really good investment for lenders, for banks. Mm -hmm. And so we were able to borrow uh, the money. Um, we did so uh, before Lehman Brothers fell, before the big financial uh, crunch occurred. And um, yet rates were relatively high at that time. Rates have been much lower since then. 
Um, but even with those higher rates, because of the savings, we've been able to more than uh, achieve a payback uh, value against that. And um, in doing so, I uh, have still a considerable savings in operations as a result. Did you get a Reggie grant related we did. to this? That's correct. So um, Ray developed a Reggie grant, which was the extension of the already installed and operating system. Ray mentioned neighborhoods, really it brought us to another group of buildings. That was the uh, Bromley Hayden uh, heat exchanger, et cetera. How many buildings does this do you eat with this? That's it's heat hard heat. to say what's a discrete building right, right now. It's How we're, you, we're heating somewhere from? around three hundred thousand square feet. And how many boilers are there? Three do it see? There's uh, two boilers. Two which are boilers and a backup oil. I see. And so actually there's several backup oil boilers. Right. This is the only building, which was a new building built at the same time as the chip plant that didn't have, wasn't originally on a oil system. So all of the other buildings that are hooked up to the chip plant have yeah. their old system still on, so for backup. Uh, this is the only one that would go down if the chip plant was down. So these old systems were unreliable, expensive, but still functioning. For us to rely on them in the future was not possible, but to use them as backup that was perfect. That's what they could be. So um, we use them very little. Um, we did do. We have a um, an ability to go off the grid uh, using a, a diesel generator backup system that can cover all of those uh, square feet and more, and um, providing both heat and um, electricity. And so that those backups are available to us, and um, we do, you know, because we're located on a mountain. Because we're running a hospital, we really do require that sophistication, that, that level of um, alternative. Uh, but basically, um, the, the boilers um, specifications that um, we were originally looking at had, is it an 8,000 BTU boiler and a 12? 8 and 4. 8 and, eight and 4. And um, we assumed we'd probably be running the two of them in January on a cold day. I think we run the 8 on a cold day in January, and mm -hmm. we run the four during the summer. And we'll, we'll interchange them, so when one's done mm -hmm. before, it's clean out. Um, so you asked about maintenance. Um, every day we'll go in and clean the ashes. It's like a wood stove. You're managing a wood stove. Um, you go in and clean out the ashes once a day. Um, you do all the readings from the, um, uh, from the brain, uh, from the emissions control and the like. Um, you do your chip ordering. Um, you make sure that the plant is kept ship shape. Mm -hmm. um, chip shape? Yeah, yeah, and uh, something like that. And um, so it's really, I think, about an hour a day of a single operator. Uh, in, more or in, less. in that hour, there's also, they'll go in and they'll turn the boiler off, giving it time to cool down. And during that time, they'll go around and vacuum. The building is always clean. One of the, a, a chip building is considered a high explosion hazard building. So the um, it has a high explosion, explosion rating on it. And that has to do with how much particulate is in there. You'll see when we go in there that it's a very clean building, and that's a testament to the guys who maintain it. They take a lot of pride in it. So there's a half hour where it's turned down to let the boiler cool a little bit. They'll go around and do other maintenance, any oil uh, greasing of fittings that is routine. And then they'll open up the door, rake out the ashes, close it up, and fire it up again. Once we brought the plan online, uh, on our own we went out and found a third party fire engineer um, group to come in to do an evaluation of the building. Um, we were kind of doing what we would call our failure mode analysis. What, what could go wrong? What might go wrong here? And uh, what can we do to uh, be on top of that? And so no one was asking us to do this. There were no requirements, there were no code problems or licensing or anything like that. We brought this company in. And um, they offered us some really good suggestions on maintenance, on cleanliness, etc. Um, we did a few switches of uh, changeouts of um, light switching, no spark generating um, technology. So we really brought the standard up just a little bit higher after the initial um, installation and gave us really the peace of mind to say, really, this is the safest plant we can make. It has proven to be very safe.
Excellent. One of the other, the Don mentioned that we have generators that uh, uh, supply electricity for the whole campus. Where the campus was off the grid for several years on those diesel generators, one of the, the benefits of those is you have true waste heat. They're just big diesel engines that are running grid, turning a, a turbine. And as in a car engine, you have waste heat. And that waste heat can run a, a piece of machinery called, it's a single effect absorption shuller, 100 ton. And single effect means it's not as efficient as you know a double effect and so forth. But basically, you're using that waste heat to create chilled water. The, um, and we are using that chilled water to air condition or to, to cool 70, 75,000 square feet of office space. And, and I think some of the hospital space yes, sir. Uh, in the main building, which is significant. Um, so that allows us to run the chip plant the whole year. Plus all of the domestic hot water. And all the, the domestic hot water. And we're a big hot water user. It's a hospital, it's a school. Hundred yeah. teenagers here, they take very long showers. Mm -hmm. So when I spoke earlier of the, the campus master plan and the, the build the build out, uh, it was calculated that our total load would be somewhere around 12 million BTUs. Our choice was to have one big boiler and throttle it down uh, to very low load when we needed that low load, uh, or to come up with uh, a system of using two boilers where they could run together to create, to create the 12 million, or to have um, a flexibility of load uh, of low load so that in the summertime running the 4 million BTU is adequate for a supply. You don't want to take a 12 million uh, BTU boiler and try and run it at 2 and 3 million BTUs. It just is not efficient. So we're trying to keep everything operating within a high level of efficiency. The, uh, the district heating as it runs from the chip building to the other end of the campus has certain places where we buried takeoffs to and in anticipation of adding to it there were um, there are several residential style homes going up on the, the north end of campus that there is a takeoff with a concept to tie them in or tie into the new co-housing that uh, might be built out there uh, there was another one going up uh, Staff House Circle, you mentioned, past the greenhouse. We actually did add that on, add three dormitories to it, and even off of that, there is a, um, that extension that we put on, there was a takeoff to grab a couple buildings that are uh, across a field and up a hill. So there are all these um, planned uh, uh, augmentation of the system, um, should they come about. Uh, when they come about. We also built the chip bin that holds the tons of wood chips uh, to be extra large in case we eventually did put on an electrical generation capability to the plant. Uh, but that's you know not near term. Uh, technology is really just emerging on that. Uh, so at this point in time uh, we do have the oversized. But for us that also represented a security of the fuel in case of bad ice storms, which we've had several, and really? um, you know, so therefore we've always got a good supply in a couple of weeks. The other so novel thing that we did in the chip bin was the typical um, delivery of chips is a they'll bring a live bed truck up to the edge of the opening, so you have a uh, overhead door. The truck comes up, the live bed ejects the chips. And it's typically maybe 16 feet deep. And then you have an angle of repose of the chips. So you have a lot of wasted space that is not filling up with chips, you know? Because mm -hmm. it's not going to uh, go out that far. Gotcha. So what we did is we built a, um, a bridge so the truck can actually back right in to the tr uh, chip bin. And we have a central tunnel with the the chip auger that travels along this side and travels along this side. And the, the, the tunnel here has pitched roof, so the truck can back in, fill this back part, fill the front part, 
It takes about four truckloads to fill the whole thing, maybe five truckloads. And how long does that last? I, I, I guess it's different. Depends different. on the season. Yeah, right. yeah. Let so, me rephrase that. How many times a year do you need deliveries, four or five truckloads? Uh, let's see. Well, we, we burn about 3,300 tons a year. Um, and it's probably, let's, for easy numbers, let's say 33 tons per truckload. Per truckload? Yeah. Wow. So 100, 100, 100 truckloads yeah. a year. Right. What temperature is the water that's going from, or does it vary depending on the season? It going, varies a little bit, but it's, you know, 195-ish, give or take 5 Going ten. from the right. boiler to your campus. Yeah, right. And it comes and back only about 3 degrees cooler. Really? Well, that was leading to my next question. What do you have about an ARC-30 insulation? Must be. Uh, I don't recall that. Must be very well insulated, though. It is well insulated. And it's very fast-moving water. Oh, really? Yeah. How yeah. fast? Well, what would it, what, how do you measure that? In gallons per minute? Or? Uh, yeah, in the flow rate, yeah. yeah. I don't, I, yeah, I, I don't know what it is. It's been years since I knew that number. The, yeah. the, the interesting thing is that one building that we got the um, Reggie funds for, uh -huh. um, to document the fact that we were um, saving energy on it, we did put a BTU meter on that. So that is one that we actually have data for in terms of BTUs per square foot and so forth. Whereas we don't have one on the, the main ship building. Regarding the Reggie program? Um, regarding the Reggie, uh, we wrote it as an adjunct or uh, trying to leverage uh, the work we were doing in the um, a section of the hospital where the domestic hot water system needed to be redone. That was an oil fired system, and uh, the tank was uh, showing early aging and needed to be redone because you can't have domestic hot water go down in the hospital. It's tragic. Uh, it's a catastrophic situation. So we were planning on redoing that and tying it into the district system. Adjacent to that building was a uh, mixed residential office space, which was a old steam heating system that uh, had lost its controls. So it was running um, as many of the old school dorms, many people may remember, that it's either superheated or you um, have the windows open. So there's, it's a window stack control. The, the only way that the heating system was on was full tilt or off. And that means that you have a very inefficient system. You're burning oil and it's going out the windows. We had that situation. I wrote the, or there's a group of us that wrote a Reggie grant for that and got it out fairly quickly and um, was to take advantage of the work we were doing and doing the domestic hot water system in the, the adjacent hospital and leveraging it so that we can uh, use some of the same pumps and such to be able to redo the uh, three story, it's a 1,300 square foot building. Um, and put it on the chip plant, and that went through beautifully. Uh, and the people now keep their windows closed. They say that they can control the heat in their rooms. They have their own thermostats. Uh, and they are very happy campers. Yeah. And, and it was the fastest delivery of any Reggie project that had been awarded. Um, so it was really something that we're, and you know, it's really Ray and crew were able to uh, deliver very quickly. And for us, again, that got us out of the risk of catastrophic failure very quickly. So it's very helpful to us. The sad piece of that is that the following year, the Reggie program changed so that individual campuses or individual entities could not qualify. You could, had to be part of a system. So like even UNH Durham could not do it, but the state colleges of New Hampshire could submit and get an award. So we're inside the uh, chip bin, and this one is unique in that the trucks can actually back right in on these tracks, dump in the back, dump in the front, and it's all pulled into the center underneath that uh, center canopy and conveyors and brings it into the building. This gives us redundancy. Uh, 
and it also gives us a greater storage for a footprint size. Typically, there would be a truck coming up to the door here, and if you want more storage, you put another door and another door, and this just gets longer and longer. But we had to blast to put this. It was expensive. We were on a mountaintop, and uh, so it made sense to do as small a footprint as possible. And down below there, you can see the auger, and uh, it just pulls the chips towards the center, and it's very simple. It stays in one spot until there's no chips, and then it'll slowly seek until it finds them. And this uh, was calculated to hold uh, at least a week's worth in the dead of winter. So if this is filled, it will easily hold more than a week's worth of supply for the whole campus um, in the dead of winter. And how many square feet of building, or how many people on the campus, or what well, are we we're, talking by we're, size? Uh, as I recall, we're heating about 300,000 square feet, um, and plus the domestic hot water. Excellent. So the trucks come up here for us to here. And this is the building we've been looking at here. We've been inside here. And here are the chips. And the nice thing is, in terms of the trucks, it's easy access to come in, they back up. They go forward, they go out on the road again, and it's very easy. No backup, no tight corners, um, and I'm a little embarrassed you're seeing some hazardous or, or fuel spills here. <laughs> we'll have to get the broom out to clean up the fuel spill.
4,000 BTU. Yeah, and this is the 8,000 BTU. Is the percent efficiency of these boilers or of the whole system or is it's that really not a unknown. unknown but you got a much higher percentage given that we're doing heat only if we were uh, doing CHP and tracking heat or tracking electricity it would be less the problem you know what I said earlier inside that um, when we were choosing to, to whether to have CHP, and you could track electrical or you could track heat. The problem, if we track electrical, we, we create too much heat. If we're tracking heat, I'm sorry, if we're tracking heat and supply only uh, as much heat as we need and producing a small amount of electricity, we run into a wall in terms of hooking up to public utilities. Yeah. Because we become a public utility if we're putting electricity online. And they want an interface that is very very expensive, and and initially, you know, they were talking about twenty thousand dollars for a study of a study to find the feasibility whether the power lines would stand it, and then we'd need a switch circuit that would shut off in half of a uh, uh, one phase uh, in case of an emergency. So this uh, blockade that they throw up makes it totally unrealistic for us to generate electricity and have it be part of the load. We could generate electricity for part of our load and have it separate from the rest of the campus. That's the only way it would become feasible. I see. 
That's not... So from that, we, we created a heat-only system. Mm -hmm. The boilers are, are probably operating in the range of uh, 80%. Um, there are some losses with pumping and so forth. Overall, the system is probably in the, somewhere in the 60s in, mm -hmm. uh, percent efficiency for overall functioning. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks. And thank you very much.